Welcome again to the Academy on Computers. This time, Computer Assisted Instruction, CAI. Jim Butterfield will be with us later on in the program, but first, as our subject is education, we invited a teacher, Joe Veda, to be with us. Joe is a resource teacher who's been working with computers and students and teachers in the classroom for the past five years. And Joe, how did you get started in the whole world of computers? Well, Jack, um, I brought the first microcomputer into my grade six classroom in 1978. And at that time, there wasn't a lot of educational software available. So my grade six students and I created our own. And why did you want to do that? Well, I believe that the computer is a tool that can help me individualize instruction for my students. So finally, maybe with the computer, we'll be able to serve the individual needs of students? I hope so. I hope so, too. Joe, could you give us a broad definition of computer-assisted instruction? I would prefer to talk about computer-assisted learning rather than just computer-assisted instruction. Computer-assisted learning takes place when a piece of software has been loaded into the computer and the computer becomes a sophisticated tool assisting a student at a particular task or with a particular task. Examples of computer-assisted learning would include things like uh, tutorials, word processing, simulation, logo, even drill and practice. Now, Joe, you've had a lot of experience writing and evaluating a good program for the computer. How would I, as a teacher, know when a program is a good one? Now, the concept of evaluating software is a very important thing, a complex thing, too. If you were looking at a piece of software, and if that piece of software supported the current curriculum, if it was free from bias, if it made effective use of the computer, and it was something that was easily modifiable to meet a range of different needs, then that's the beginning. All right, are, are these the only things I should be aware of? No, we, we could continue the evaluation under three different headings content, technical considerations, and design. Under content, is the information presented to the student relevant? Is it up to date? And is it accurate? Uh, the vocabulary and style, is, is it suited to the students using the program? Documentation, is documentation available to support the intent of the program or even indications on how to use it? The technical considerations, does the program work in the equipment that you have in your room? Uh, does it require uh, peripherals, like a printer, that you might not have. Is the program straightforward and easy to use? Under the design, is there sufficient feedback to the student? Does it accept uh, a range of correct answers? And is assistance available to the student while operating the program when the student needs assistance? All right, there's an awful lot there, Joe. I wonder, as a teacher, if there's three or four questions that, that I could ask myself to help me sum up a good program. Mm -hmm. Well, one would be, does it help the student work more effectively? Uh, does it reinforce needed skills? Does it help meet individual student differences? And is it creative use of the computer? All right. Now, if a program meets all these criteria, has all these qualities, is there any guarantee that a student using the program is learning? <laughs> there are no guarantees. <laughs> <laughs> However, with the, the computer and some good software, I've probably got a better chance than I've ever had before. And that's, that's really important. If I can have a student learning more and learning more effectively uh, at an individual pace, that's a, that's a really important step. So it's serving the individual students. I hope All so. Right. All right. So you, you brought a couple of programs along to show us. Uh, let's see. Speed selling. Well, what, what's the history on this one, Bill? Oh, this is one of the programs that those great six students and I wrote. Uh -huh. So um, how does it work? Well, okay. It's meant to, to practice particular words that are part of our, our spelling curriculum. Let's begin the program. Press the space bar to continue, so we'll begin it. The instructions are printed on the screen and they indicate that it's going to flash a word. And we're supposed to recognize and then duplicate the word. Recognize and then spell the word. All right, and we have certain categories here. Well, this is the beginning of, of this business of adapting to the individual. Uh, we have choices, not just any old word in the grade six curriculum, in the spelling curriculum, but particular errors as possibly identified by a diagnostic test. Let's Take a look at the, the doubling error. Okay, let's put your name in. Uh, yeah, that's a good one for me. Spelling uh, double letters. I need that help. 
Okay, the program automatically writes records and keeps track of what's going on. So I just went to the disk and checked to see if you were in the records. And earlier, of course, we took you in. Right. Let's now take a look at the record until you can see Oh, please, don't look at my record. Okay, Jack, good luck with the drill. And if you're a good scholar, it's going to be okay. Here we go. We have the option of looking at the words that are going directly into the program, and usually the students go directly into the program. Here we go. Okay, the first question. Right. And you notice it's, it's indicating that the next word is going to be flashed for a shorter period on the time. We got it right, so it's speeding up for us. Good. Let's try and get it right again. Oh, mm. lucky. All right. And it's speeding up now? So yes, it's, it's going full tilt, the 50th of the second. Let's get the next one wrong. Then. <laughs> well, we may do it anyway. The 50th of the second, I'll make it wrong in Okay. Uh, <laughs> you saw that already, did you? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. An intention layer is uh, incorrect. It's going to give us a chance at the same word, at the same speed. Same word, same, same word, speed. same speed. All right. Okay, let's get it wrong again. And at this point, it indicates what the correct word was, and you notice it slowed down. All right, so it gives us a correction, it slows us down. All right, are these exemplary programs you brought along with telling us all the criteria before? Would that be an exemplary program? No, particularly this one. It's not an exemplary piece of software, but it's a beginning. It does meet some of the criteria. We can control the speed, the individual yeah. cases. Uh, we selected particular groups of words that the student needs to practice. That's requisite practice, not just any practice. It's requisite practice. Yeah, practice. It's a good beginning. And it's right on the curriculum because it's the degree six words. Yeah. You could use this at other, other levels. Well, we found, because not all the students in the room were grade 6 students, we, as soon as we wrote it in the work once, we adapted it to grade 5, grade 6, grade 7. It was very, very easy to do. Now, the second program here, it looks like a much different program. This is Good Food Puzzles. Now, did you make this one too? No, this is a, a commercial program. It's produced by the learning company. All right. What is the purpose of this program? Well, it, it's, a, it's a lot harder to categorize than the first time. This particular one is going to give a student the opportunity to practice solving problems. It's a very important thing. Right. It's meant for primary students. Right. We've already got the program set up so that we can actually begin. Uh, solving problems on the primary curriculum. Yes. Problem? Well, one of the things that primary students are responsible for is the concept of uh, classifying matter, that, uh, uh, both in science and in mathematics. This, is going to, this particular game is going to give us practice uh, sorting things, classifying things, uh, according to both colors, uh, Shape and even position on the screen. Let's see what Gertrude does. Okay, let's let Gertrude get off to give us a start. She's flying away to bring us in our puzzle pieces. These puzzle pieces are to what, go in the, in the square? Yes, yeah, let's, right. let's take a look at, at the instructions. We'll actually right. move down into the area, which will tell us how the game is played. And in essence, what we have to do is play each shape of a different color in a different position so they don't match next to each other. Right. We can even go down to the bottom of the screen and the cross so that we can see the sample answer. And you can see from that the, the process of classification, the red square and the green square and the blue square. Neither square or any of the squares come next to each other. The colors, uh, the shape, and the position are things that the students can actually work on. Classification is part of the group. Now, it seems to me, though, Joe, this is for primary students, right? And in, in their class, I could work at a, a table or a sandbox or, you know, or anything else in, in the room using cardboard boxes, pieces of cutout paper, and I could uh, teach the same thing or at least experience the same thing with, with the children. Could I not? Seriously, you could try that. But an important consideration that's built into this program is that the teacher can go in, and there's a, um, a page called the editing, and they, the teacher could actually change the way this program operates. Uh, it could become simpler, it could become more difficult, the shapes could be changed, easily changed, to meet different student needs. And that's what we were talking about before, the mm -hmm. concept of meeting the individual needs. Now you could do that with your box and your tables and your blocks, but it would be a lot longer, it would be a lot more difficult. Appropriate use, a good and beginning. The good criteria, again, of this thing includes the individual instruction, what else? Yeah. The, the criteria. Now, again, we're, we're talking about meeting the individual needs. Uh, something again that is, is attached to the curriculum that's already in place. You know, the concept of classification. 
So individualized instruction is uh, adjustable by the teacher to meet different needs of different students. And it, it's fun. It's, oh, it's appropriate use of color, too, by the Joe, you brought along two good examples of computer-assisted instruction. Thanks to Joe Veda, Jim Butterfield and I will be here with other studio guests and talk more about computer-assisted instruction and learning right after this. Academy participants, if you're finding you're having difficulties answering the questions on recursion, looping, and branching, functions common to Logo and other computer languages, a good source of help is the series of articles on Logo in the Academy newsletters. Also consult reference sources such as introductory computer text and computer dictionaries at your local library. The bibliography in the Educational Applications Handbook will also provide references for further exploration. Our three studio guests are Diane Dino, an office automation consultant, Joanne Wilton, a consultant in computer ed for a school board, and Kathy Lee, a computer application therapist. Jim, let's talk about CAI. Good. I'd like to ask each of our guests how they're using CAI. Diane. Well, right now I'm involved in a project with the government where we're using microcomputers interface with videotape machines. And we're teaching managers how to conduct evaluation interviews with their employees. The microcomputers turn the videotape machines on and off? Right, and they also control what you see on the videotape and when you see it. Very good. Joanne. Well, in the school boards, um, right across the grades were first to the being used in kindergarten right up, and all subject days as well. The only limiting factor is the, we can only run CAI, but we have hardware, and we have a very important factor, software, and there we've had people training. Do you have a special involvement? Well, I'm not in the classroom now, but when I was a year and a half ago, I used the control centrally in geography for doing practice, for tutorial, and for a lot of simulation. Kathy? Yes, I'm involved in the implementation of CAI with home person. For these people, um, the microcomputer has become a very powerful tool uh, in many cases as a electronic pen and paper. Pen and paper. Mm -hmm. What do you like? about CAI and computers in the classroom. Happy. It's the flexibility of the microcomputer that allows somebody with a physical handicap access to educational material that would that they would not otherwise have access to. Then we're providing these people with the um, activities that the children and young adults would have access to. Diane, what do you like about CAI? Well it's a business sense. You look at training the Western business right now. They often use workshops to do training. And it might not be useful for the individual person. A two-day workshop, there might be only, say, two hours that's directly applicable to an individual. And not only that, they may have to wait several months for it before a workshop is scheduled. So they can come to the consultant when they need to learn a particular skill, and they can just select what they're interested in learning so they have more control over their own learning process. And what kind of training did the CAI student replace? Basically, stand-up workshop training, often just reading things out of manuals or workbooks. So this is much more interactive and much more individualized. Do they replace a specific part of my activity? Well, not often. It doesn't replace anything. It enhances the learning experience. And it, it offers another tool to the teacher and, and of course, to the learner. It can add, though, an individualization, as Don has said, to the experience the computer or the computer materials that are being run can much more, more closely interact with where the learner is at that moment in their experience. You say individualizing, yet we think of computers as sort of mass production learning. How do you mean that term, individualized? Well, I certainly don't mean necessarily one-on-one -on -one for the computer. Uh, some of the very best experiences with learning experiences with computers happen in small groups. Uh, the kind of interaction that happens between people or among a group of people uh, when they're working at the computer. And the computer is the ar arbiter of, of the experience. It's something special that you can't get in a in the classroom. So it individualized really means keeping the learner learners at the point that they are now in that experience. Uh, I think you must find that the microcomputer replaces or perhaps provides a brand new type of facility to your students. Yes, the student, this is the first time that they would have to independently control something, okay? So they have finally independent access to a program and 
first time they're able to actually write notes themselves and share this with other students. Uh, in the past, they would have required a teacher or a teacher's aide sitting right beside them recording the information. But now they can do it themselves? Yes, that's right. Diane, what do you think some of the characteristics of good CAI would be? Okay, well, I have to preface my remarks saying that not that we consider good CAI is available to the teachers, say, with an iPad in the classroom, but there are some characteristics that many people think that CAI does. First of all, you want the teacher to be able to adapt to the new experience. For example, if they're having trouble with something, the question's a little easier, present something in a different way, provide different kinds of examples. I wonder if you have anything to add to that. Well, very much, as Diane said about the, the program, not the computer adapting, but the program and the computer being the adapting to, to the learner and following the, the, the branch that the learner is on. Uh, but there are other aspects as well. I think the most powerful kinds of CAI that we have are ones which allow the learner to have control. Uh, to get a task and allow the learner to explore with that task as they seek the right answer. Are we there yet? No, but we are starting to get more yeah. software now that's leading in that direction. It's promising. Okay, now if you're planning to use a computer for CAI, are there any special hardware considerations you should keep in mind in, in planning for this kind of a computer system? Joanne. Well, as I said, software is up to you. And what you decide first is, is what you want the learning experience to be and what the software will have to be like. And then you have the hardware that will be able to carry or deliver that learning experience. Uh, things that you might look at, though, may be color or graphics capability, or perhaps alternative input devices. Uh, I'm particularly interested in mice and, and uh, perfect control devices that allow a student to interact intellectually with the program. The student is looking at the screen, they sense the answer to the, to the question, and they're able to input without having to break their activity, look down at the keyboard, figure out how to spell a word. There'll be a time and place for practicing spelling and a time and place for learning keyboard skills. You, you, you think of the mouse which allows you to roll a little device around on a table and position things on the screen, you view those as very important in interaction. Yes. I've I never think known. That, I think they allow us where we want to be, which is intellectual link between the learner or learners mm -hmm. and the software, and bypasses the software problem. I've never known whether to call them in the plural mouses or mice, but I suppose one's as good as the other. At the moment you're so expensive, I've never seen them in the plural. I'll tell me something singular. Okay, good. How about the interaction? How about uh, things like speech synthesis? Is this also an important form of interaction? It may be down the road, but at the moment any, any program that involves speech synthesis really helps to not be making the most effective use, at least this is in a, a normal classroom situation. We tend to have a tool, and so we pack it on and we use it without actually getting a good learning experience from it. But it'll come eventually. Okay. Now, Kathy, I gather you have a specialized view of the mm -hmm. kind of computer interfaces and hardware yes. that would suit your role. Mm -hmm. Again, I'd like to reinforce what Joanne has said, that the system is dictated by the, the software that is required by the uh, um, but, as you say, we are, do rely heavily on sort of modified types of um, uh, hardware. For example, this is a keyboard guard that could just go over a regular keyboard um, to help someone with some extraneous movement to control um, the keys. This is uh, an enlarged keyboard, so some of the large movement could uh, access the different uh, letters. And, <coughs> The reverse is the miniature keyboard. And then these are a variety of um, single switches that you can access different programs um, with just a uh, movement, either the head or arm, or even uh, exotic movements like you know, using the eyebrows. Other hardware requirements, I think, that are important for the handicap are uh, things like printing. It's important for these people who can't write to have a hard copy of their work. Um, I think this drives the students for the quicker access of information. But it's not just the devices, it's the way they come together in a computer environment that really makes a difference. That's right. It? That's right. So, for example, though some of these uh, hardware items might be able to um, interface with the different uh, computer systems, you have to have the appropriate software that will go along with it. Okay. 
I'd like to ask you a question about microcomputers versus big computers, because we've seen education and CA and big computers. How do the education on the two compare one with the other? Diane. Oh, I think the bigger computers right now offer more sophisticated authoring languages so that the instructional designer can use more variety in instructional design. So they often have more sophisticated monitoring of student performance and recording of student performance data. The designer can respond to what the student is doing and can change the program easily. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'd like that to be usual at home, not in a classroom and not in a, a general supervised environment. If you're at home, you have your own microcomputer, and you want to go in and you want to buy some educational program. Can you get good education programs? Are they worthwhile? Do they do the job? Joanne. Well, my perspective has to be um, educational programs that tend to teach children or tend to take over some of the roles of the school. And I have some really con uh, big concerns about parents going out and buying that kind of software, which guarantees to teach in six months, three or four years of uh, mathematics. Uh, there are so many other things involved in young children learning, and state of readiness is one of them. The preparation, the basic skills leading up to it, and often the parents can't sense that. And by presenting the children, mm -hmm. you know, too late, they really uh, make those materials ineffective. I can see the time, though, when CAI materials will be linked to the curriculum in the school, and students will take those materials home to do their homework with. Okay, but I can't believe that the computer is good for training all things. I, I can't really believe that I can go to my computer store and buy a program that would teach me how to be a cordon bleu cook. Diane, what do you think about it? Well, you might not be able to do that now, but I think it might be coming along in the future. For example, if you interface the video with the computer, then perhaps you could see a model of a skilled cook actually doing it, step by step breaking it down, and you get a chance to practice. So, you know, it may be possible. So video is coming, but it might be possible. That's true. But, okay, yes, but go ahead. It, it won't be nearly as costly as all the mistakes you'll make with practicing in your kitchen to become a core dog. That cook, you'd be you better off to practice with the software first. So. Perhaps I could eat my mistakes. I just want to ask a long term question. What then do you think we'll see in CI and computer based learning in the future? Diane. Oh, I think we're going to see a move to the collided discovery learning. We have creative learning environments now, logo, where the child or even an adult can explore explore, problem solving, doing logical thinking. But now we're going to add to that a computer coach that would step in when the student is having a problem and say, would you like some help? And the student said yes. Then they offer various kinds of help. So we're integrating the tutor with the creative problem solving environment. So it's a more creative and a more intelligent computer in a way. Yeah. Kathy, where do you think the CAI is going? Um, I do, Diane. Um, I think the point I'd like to make is that we still need the human contact in all of the CAI. There's so much that you can do um, with the computer, but I think you need the, the discussion with the person or group of people. But it still won't replace the teacher then? No. Okay, Joanne, you have the last word. Okay. A new kind of software I think will be coming up for CAI in the future. The software which is really empty. We have all our software designers up till now have, have tried to impress us by putting all of them now into the computer and having presented back to the student. Up towards empty software, which the student then fills up as they learn, and organizes structures, and then calls upon that database that they themselves. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Yeah. Joanne and Kathy. And Jim and I will be back to answer some of your questions right after this. Next on Bits and Bytes, games. Billy Van and Luba Goy will analyze some computer games and show us that good computer simulation games contain the same elements as a good lesson. We'll find out the meaning of analog and digital and we'll learn how to boot DOS. That's the next edition of Bits and Bytes and following it, Jack Lisley and Jim Butterfield will be back with guests for further exploration. Games on Bits and Bytes, follow up the Academy with Jack Lisley. All right, here's the questions that have come in since our last show. It says, in your last show, you drew a chart of a Pascal program. Can you tell me the name of the chart and where I can know about it? This chart is called a nazi Schneiderman diagram, or sometimes just a structured flow chart. It's one of the ways of diagramming the flow of logic in structured programs. If you really want to go after the literature, it was first published by Nassie and Schneiderman in a paper for the 
big plan notices of the issue back in August 1973. But you probably don't need to do that if you can understand the logical way of diagramming decision, repetition, and action. You don't have any trouble finding out how to use that yourself. I've been reading literature on some of the more powerful new computers. I see that some don't use byte, which I understand to be a group of letters. In fact, they use word, 16, or even letters. Is the term byte a for these computers? No, not at all. Memory is still measured in terms of bytes of storage, so whether the machine has 16 bits or 32 bits or whatever it has, if you see that the machine has 64K storage, you can be sure that it has about 64,000 characters of storage in its memory. Bytes are still the object. All right, Jim, another resident asks, I've noticed a reference to six disks. What is it, and why would I use one? We referred to six disks before the program. We call it a hard disk. It is a large capacity disk. It brings much more information than a floppy disk. And the reason why we call it fixed is that it's not removable. You may recall that when we have some information on a floppy disk, we take it out, we can put it away. The fixed disk stays in the drive all the time. Now, that's good because you have a huge capacity and a very, very fast access to this information. But at the same time, because you cannot normally remove the disk from where it sits, then you have several limitations. They're not interchangeable. You can't swap your payroll for something else. So you look two basic programs together. I'd like to use parts of two different programs to create a new program, but it seems like a lot of typing. Well, mixing two programs together in the way I understand the question to be asked is usually called merging. You can take parts of one program and merge them together with part of another program. Now, many computers have this capability either built in or can be added with certain utility programs. What you should do is you should talk to your computer dealer find out what's possible on your machine. Is there any way to protect against the power failure during the of a program? Well, if you want to protect against the power failure, you'll need some sort of battery to keep the power on your machine after the AC has somehow gone. Uh, that can be done. Uh, many machines can be fitted with batteries to tie you over a power failure. And of course, some of the new handheld computers have batteries built in, so you don't even need power for them at all, except from the batteries. Interesting question. Time for one more, Jim. How do I know if my disk is full, and how can I tell if it's really full? Well, last part first. Anytime you take a catalog or a directory, you'll be told how much space is available on your disk. So you can know when you're starting to run the of available space and be able to do it. On the other hand, if you try to save something on a disk that hasn't got the room, you will get an error for this. This will tell you you can't do it. Thanks, Jim. That's all the time for this time. Next time, computer games and simulations. Jack Silverstein with Jim Butterfield saying, join us then on the Academy.